Welcome ladies and gentlemen, the topic is ecology and in today's lesson we are discussing feeding relationships between organisms. In the previous lesson uh, we looked at the different ecological pyramids. We looked at pyramids of numbers, pyramids of biomass and pyramids of energy. And uh, I think that most of us can now differentiate between these different pyramids and you can even plot them in your locality at home or at school. So today we want to look at the feeding relationships between organisms. Organisms have various feeding relationships, some of them beneficial, others harmful. Well, let's look at them, let's see one by one. So at our level, we want to look at uh, a one by one, starting with parasitism, from the word parasite, parasitism. This is an association between two organisms in which one organism, the parasite, is nutritionally dependent on the other, the host. So the, there is a parasite and then there is a host. The parasite is dependent on the host. The parasite benefits nutritionally on the host. The host is harmed in the process. That is what is important here now. That it is a feeding relationship between two organisms. One called the parasite and the other called a host. But in this feeding relationship, the parasite benefits, but the host is harmed. Yeah, the host is harmed. In some cases, some hosts succumb to parasites and lose their lives. We shall see later on. There are two categories of parasites. And I know you must have heard this ones before. One is endoparasites and the other one is ectoparasites. The word endo means inside and ecto means out, outside the body. So the endoparasites, these ones live inside the body of the host. Yeah, so the endoparasite lives inside the body of the host. For example, the plasmodium parasite, that one that causes malaria. It lives entirely inside the host, either inside the mosquito or inside the human being. Then we have the HIV virus, which is a parasite that causes AIDS. And there are many others, including tapeworms and others. We shall see a number of them later. Then we have ectoparasites. These are parasites which live outside the the body of the host. So these ones live on the surface, usually, on the surface of the body. For example, the ticks, you know the ticks very well. You see them on the ears of the dogs, on the skin of the, the, the cattle, the cows, the goats. Then we have the lice, the fleas, and so on. Those are ectoparasites. They live outside. So our dear students, we, are, we should be able now to differentiate, to categorize the parasites into two categories. Endoparasites and ectoparasites. Great. We can see there an example of the endoparasites. The tapeworm there inside the intestine of the cow. That one there is called tinea sagnata. That one is endoparasites. It lives inside the host and then we have that one that one is feeding on the blood of the host but from the surface the mosquito there that one is ecto parasite and then we have another one there the cow is affected by the ecto parasites the ticks you can see the ear of that cow there we saw that cow from Kakoge, Kakoge sub-county, 
in Nakasongola district. And many other cows around your village. You can see um, the ticks around the ears, the skin, and so on. Those ones are ectoparasites. Great. So we can now differentiate the endo and the ecto what? Parasites. We also have other words used to describe parasites. We have parasites that are called obligate parasites. Obligate. These are parasites which cannot live without their hosts. That is interesting. They cannot live without the hosts. I want you to differentiate them from the endo. Endo live inside the host, but these ones cannot live without the host. Meaning, if the host is not there, they are also not there. They cannot survive minus the host. Examples include the plasmodium parasites too. Without the host, we cannot get plasmodium parasite living in space or on land or anywhere. No. The other one is HIV virus. That one cannot live outside the body of the host. And many other parasites. Such kind of parasites are called obligate parasites. And then we have another description of parasites, the facultative parasites. Facultative. These ones can spend some time outside the bodies of their hosts. Eh, meaning even when the host is not there for some time, these parasites can survive a bit outside the, the bodies of the hosts. For example, the ticks. The ticks have a capacity of living outside the host for many weeks. Then when they find the host, then they can still attach on the host and survive. So they are able to live outside the host for some time. Those ones are called facultative parasites. Obligate parasites cannot live without the host. You detach them from the host, they are also gone. They are dead. The facultative parasites, they can live outside the host. You can remove the ticks from the body of the cow and the tick continues moving. And then we have the other category, the incidental parasites. From the word incidental. These are organisms that are not usually parasites, but they may become parasites due to factors like lack of normal food, increase in their numbers. Yes. So these are incidental, meaning usually they are not parasites. Originally, they are able to survive. They are free living. But if the conditions are not so favorable for them to live freely, then they can opt to become parasites as a secondary kind of way of survival. Those ones are called incident. For example, we have the entamoeba gingivalis. This one that causes uh, osteomyelitis of the mandible. The swelling of the gum yeah, in the mouth. And then a number of round worms also can be incidental parasites. Initially, they are free living. They can live around on land, in water. But when the host when the conditions are not favorable, the food is not available, or they are extremely many in number and the competition is high, then they can also behave as hosts. So we can describe, use those words to describe parasites. Obligate parasites, they cannot live without the host. Facultative parasites, they can live without the host for some time. When, when the host is not there, they can survive. Then when the host is there, the better for them as well. Then incidental parasites, these are organisms that are not purely parasites. They are not made to be parasites. But they are conditionally forced to become parasites due to some conditions. Great. So my dear students, I hope we are able to get those three descriptions of parasites. And I also hope that you can differentiate them from endoparasites and ectoparasites. So those are the terms I want you to understand now. So let's move on to general adaptations of parasites. Well, for you to be successful, 
there must be some either structural or behavioral characteristics that uh, they portray to be able to, to be successful to be able to be successful one of the successes of parasites is their ability to find a suitable host so if they are able to get a suitable host in time when they require then we can say they are successful and then getting the host is not enough also surviving inside the host is another adaptation so the success of parasites is dependent on those two one ability to find the host then the other one ability to survive the host to survive inside the host through evading the defense mechanisms of the hosts so the following are the general adaptations of the parasites one they have a means of attachment to the host yeah when they find the host for example the ticks have legs that are well adapted to to firmly grip on the skin of the cows or the bulls so they have means of attachment to the host and then they also have penetrative devices for entering and feeding on the host some of them have very sharp mouth parts for example you know the mosquitoes have the stylet which is very sharp can pierce the skin of the human being and suck the blood so most of the parasites have those penetrative devices and then the other one is they show degeneration of unnecessary organs and systems to reduce their body size in order to fit inside the host great some of them have lost their limbs they don't have limbs they don't have some of them don't have eyes so their parts are reduced so that they can easily fit in the host without any challenge that is also an adaptation and then they produce many eggs some produce seeds those that are plant parasites or spores the fungal parasites to enhance their survival imagine you keep your bread on the in your in the container or in the cupboard for one week from nowhere you see the bread molds where are, where did the spores come from it means the spores are extremely many they are ambiquitous they are very many they are everywhere so they just require conditions to germinate so those are some of the what adaptations of the parasites they they produce very many eggs uh, there are some category of roundworms that can produce to up to 200 eggs a day that is almost a population of all ginger district if there's a people that means if that was a human being they would produce the whole country within a week or so or two weeks so these guys have extremely higher reproductive rate and that's one of the adaptations they have to survive yeah in their habitats to increase the advantage of survival by producing many eggs seeds or spores to enhance their survival the other one is they have vector intermediate hosts some of them have intermediate hosts which are vectors uh, for example the plasmodium has an intermediate host which is a, a mosquito which at the same time can transmit it to the next definitive host for example the also the tapeworms their intermediate hosts are either pigs or cows that can pass them easily to humans so many parasites employ intermediate hosts to reach their definitive hosts intermediate hosts are like middlemen in between the parasite and the definitive host the definitive host is a host where the parasite completes its life cycle from then the intermediate host is where some of the stages of the life cycle develop from and then finally some of them are resistant they have resistant stages to survive in the periods when they are outside the host or even inside the host they have resistant stages for example they form cysts 
yeah they form cysts most of the bacteria form cysts that uh, prevent them from being damaged by the host defense systems or by adverse weather conditions and therefore they become ex ex extremophiles so those are some of the adaptations of parasites to survive uh, to be to be parasites where they are so we can look at uh, one beautiful parasite there great i hope by now we are able to at least give the adaptations of the parasites uh -huh. so those features that enable them to survive in their hosts or to find their hosts yeah a question can come around there you should be able to authoritatively answer it so from here we are going to look at uh, uh, different parasites one by one we are not going to look at all of them but we shall select a few common parasites especially those that affect us the most one of them is the plasmodium plasmodium parasite and this is a protozoan parasite that causes malaria and you know that malaria is and is still the leading killer disease in the sub-saharan africa even when we have corona these days malaria is still the leading killer disease in sub-saharan africa so it's worth it for us to study this causative agent and we learn how it behaves it's transmitted from one person to another by a mosquito called the female anopheles mosquito not any other other mosquitoes transmit other parasites but particularly it is the female anopheles mosquito that transmits what plasmodium or oh, that causes malaria and therefore it is called a vector a vector is an organism that transmits a disease causing germ or organism so let's look at the life cycle of the plasmodium members to begin with the mosquitoes bite the human beings and inject the saliva to stop the blood from clotting in its alimentary canal so the mosquitoes have a very unique feeding mechanism that when they bite you they inject you with the saliva that prevents that blood from clotting either in its stylet or even in its alimentary canal so it therefore sucks the blood it has an anticoagulant uh, mechanism and anticoagulating chemicals that stop blood from clotting then it sucks so in the process hundreds of parasites are moved from the mosquito to the person so as the mosquito sucks your blood in a reverse way it is also releasing the plasmodium parasites into you into your blood so the parasites move to the liver after entering into your blood system the first destination of the plasmodium is the liver of the human being and then from there they burrow into the liver cells they go and hide there they enter they invade into the liver cells and then they start carrying out reproduction they reproduce very fast within one or two weeks the daughter cells break out of the liver these ones are called the sporozoites they break out of the liver and move to invade the red blood cells so the first destination is the liver from the blood to the liver from the liver to the red blood what cells now in the red blood cells they reproduce rapidly causing the cells to rupture so after they have attacked the red blood cells they all continue reproducing and then eventually the red blood cells will also rupture they will break to release more red, more plasmodium parasites and these plasmodium parasites again invade other red blood cells around so from one red blood cell to the other to the other all over the body causing them also to rupture to break to burst so if now in that process as the red blood cells rupture and burst that's when you begin feeling the signs and symptoms of malaria the chills the high fever the headache the body weakness 
yeah body weakness because the red blood cells are meant to carry oxygen but now they are rupturing and their number is reducing in the long run you even suffer from anemia lack of enough blood from the body um if a mosquito sucks blood from an infected person so at that time when you have the the parasite at your red blood cells or around the body cells and the mosquito bites you and sucks it takes up these parasites uh-huh so as the mosquito sucks you there are two things involved either it is injecting you with the malaria with the malaria parasite or it's actually taking away the parasites from you to, to, to another person the parasites reproduce in the mosquito and migrate to the salivary glands ready to infect the next person when the mosquito bites so that is what happens here so in the life cycle of the plasmodium parasite the first story is if we start from the vector which is the mosquito let's look at this illustration here in summary the vector bites the host and injects the plasmodium parasites in this case they are in a stage of sporozoites from here those sporozoites enter the liver cells from which they will multiply and divide very fast and multiply from there they are released into the red blood cells they invade very many red blood cells after entering into the red blood cells they continue multiplying and then when there are very many in a red blood cell the blood cell bursts to release very many again that will invade other red blood cells and the infection continues at that level you stand a very high chance of suffering from severe symptoms or even death and then at that level it is when the mosquito can bite you and even pick it from you and take it to another person and the process continues it's a cycle as you can see uh, from there it's a very clear cycle there as you can see the mosquito through the blood vessels to the liver from the liver to the red blood cells from the red blood cells to the mosquito again and the cycle continues so now you have at least suffered from malaria i'm very sure now you know what happens yeah the stage at which you are very 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 uh, uh severe with the symptoms and signs is when the parasites are at your new red blood cells bursting them even if release urine which is yellowish orange yeah urine that contains some hemoglobin particles hemoglobin molecules a sign that you are losing blood you are losing blood and subsequently you can suffer from anemia and the, the the worst group affected are the children below the age of five and the pregnant women and the elderly yeah they are the people who suffer most from malaria however all of us should prevent it and we are going to see how we can do it so members each time the daughter cells of plasmodia are released thousands of red blood cells rupture and the patient experiences chills accompanied by shivering and sweating yeah that's what i told you earlier on the patient may also become anemic due to the loss of red blood what cells great so now that we have known that malaria is a very serious disease especially in the tropical world we would want to know how we can prevent it so you cannot control malaria if you do not control the mosquito the best way of controlling malaria is by stopping the mosquitoes and most of our control measures are around controlling mosquitoes to begin with we spray the walls of dwelling places with insecticides the insecticide may also be sprayed directly on the mosquito vector so when you are spraying you can spray your house the walls in most cases we don't know how to spray you just spray in the air 
and the whole place begins smelling with your insecticide and you think you have managed the mosquitoes. Yes? No, not knowing that the air blows away the, the insecticide. So you spray on the walls, on the corners, on the sides of the house, on the wall, under the bed. And if you see the mosquitoes, you spray directly on them. You will be able to mitigate, to, to chase them away or even kill them. Uh, and you know most of the insecticides. Who knows any insecticide that we use for spraying mosquitoes? Yes, I'm hearing very many people know. You are telling me different uh, insecticides there. Great. Two, draining all stagnant water to prevent mosquitoes from breeding. They breed in stagnant water which is not flowing. So what do you do? You drain this water. Remove it. You clear it away so that they don't have chance of breeding there. Then removing broken bottles, old tins, old car tires, in which water may collect. This also prevents the breeding of mosquitoes. This one happens at home. Even just a small bottle at home there. Even a, a tire, an old tire collecting water, is enough to breed very many mosquitoes that can disturb you for very many weeks. So if you have them around, please drain them so that you are safer. Sleeping under insecticide treated mosquito nets of recent the government has been distributing some of these nets and also you can buy them and sleep under them not on them i have seen many students at school sleeping on top of the net you lay the net like a bed sheet then you sleep on top of it then cover yourself that is an abuse of the net put the net on top and space it well so that you sleep in the middle don't be, don't lean against the net the mosquitoes can still find you. Then the other one is treating an infected uh, person using antimalarial drugs. You can treat. Yeah, you can treat. In case you get infected, very fast go and test. Don't do self-medication. First test. Malaria tests are cheaper and easier. Test them and then find out the level of malaria you have and then administer medicine as prescribed by the medical worker. And make sure you complete the dose. If you don't complete the dose, you are worsening the situation. There is a tendency in most cases of you starting the dose, then you start feeling well, then you stop. It means that you are complicating your situation. The, the malaria parasite may mutate and the, that medicine may not be effective next time. Great! Uh, you can see that beautiful mother with her baby sleeping under the mosquito net. They are doing prevention of malaria by stopping they have stopped mosquitoes from reaching them. And those guys are very happy because they are going to stop malaria by stopping mosquitoes from biting them. I wish you can also do that. Do that at home so that you minimize costs of treatment and reserve energy for doing better things other than treating malaria, suffering, and so on. Thank you very much for attending this lesson. I hope you benefited and uh, in the next lesson I want to meet you when you have already started using the net and when you have uh, started a campaign of stopping malaria in your compounds. Thank you very much. Stay safe and be blessed.